nothing yet, so that's good. I'm uh, Tim Spann. I'm a developer advocate at Stream Native. We're the Apache Pulsar people, but if you've known me from the past, I'm a pretty big uh, Apache Ni5 fan. So since that's in the same streaming uh, ecosystem with Apache Pulsar, work together pretty nicely. So not a big deal for me doing uh, Ni5. Uh, I'm hoping for next year we've got someone else might want to join me as I'm not too close to the committers now based on where I'm working, but I would love to uh, work with someone maybe from uh, Cloud Era on that, collaborate for next year. But if you have any questions, feel free to put them in there. I've got slides and an agenda, but this is pre pretty free form. Just going to explore around different parts of Apache NiFi and see what's, uh, you know, little tips, pointers, Try to point things out that uh, sometimes you don't notice until you've built and had a lot of apps die, unfortunately. Oh, we got a question already. How to scan file names, metadata from HDFS and the put, ooh, exactly once. Exactly once is everyone's uh, always, always really hard because things can go wrong <laughs> in a lot of different ways with exactly once. That's uh, you have whole theories there, especially HDFS is nice because HDFS supports exactly once one of the few sources and sinks out there that does and does a really good job at it. So that part's good. Um, I think NIFI does exactly once in very specific circumstances. Uh, the, the one thing I would do is it either you get the HDFS or probably list HDFS might be the safest. You add your list. Now, the one thing you're going to want to do, NIFI is usually clustered. Something to think about right here. By default, it's going to run on the primary node. And the reason we want to do that is so we don't, you know, have a problem with that exactly once. If I run out of multiple nodes, uh, you're asking for problems. So make sure that's in primary node. If that primary node goes down, in theory, Zookeeper should be able to uh, help you. Depends when it crashes. This is, again, where you might uh, have issues and you might want to figure out how you're doing this. What you might want to do is start here, get your directory, have whatever filters. You might want a minimum age there to make sure the files are ready before you start scanning them. Again, you might have to play with this. And then after list, very common pattern with everything in uh, NiFi is a list goes with a fetch. Now, what the fetch itself, that could be running on all nodes because it's going to NiFi is going to smart distribute them. Again, if you want exactly once and you want it in a certain order, you might make this primary as well. Uh, this is where we start to go exactly once and you're kind of worried about exactly once. You may want to do something like push this to uh, push this record to Pulsar so that I know I can control it and I'm not going to lose the data. And then have someone consume it on the other side that's really good with exactly one semantics. It could be a Pulsar sync. It could be Flink. It could be Spark. You know, that's up to you. But getting it into a persistent queue outside of NiFi that's in a redundant cluster is probably a smart idea if you're really concerned with being in order, you know, no duplicates, all those sort of things. That might be what you want to think about. I don't know how much you want to do here. The more steps you add, the more chance for issues that come up. Uh, the other thing to make this easier and more guarantees around exactly once job oriented is I've got an article here. There's another engine for NiFi that came out. Ooh, it's probably more than a year ago now. This is the uh, stateless engine. 
me see if I have any details here for that one. Yeah, you might want to take a look at the stateless engine. This one will run idempotent, will run job at a time, which may be a nice way to do with this one. Get the metadata or the file from HDFS, process it, complete, go on to the next one. You know, because NIFI tends to want to run constantly. And that's when you could get in trouble with uh, exactly one, something stops, something starts. Take a look at stateless, stateless plus uh, list HDFS. You should be okay. Trying to think if there was a separate one for metadata. I thought there was the file info. I'm trying to think which one, if this is getting more. Uh, yeah, I, I like the idea of sticking with list HDFS. I should have most of the metadata you need. If not, you know, there, there, there's probably some other options out there. But that that's the best case you can get for uh, exactly once without uh, something going uh, askew for you there. Let's get back to the slides. <laughs> in the wrong slides. Unless you guys are here for deep learning. Okay, let's go back. Sorry about that. Very similar stuff here. So, NIFI deep dive. That was a good question. Uh, some more talks that are interesting. These will uh, be out in the slides. I'll put them out uh, when I finish with what's going on. This is me. There's a lot of Apache projects I like. I try to put them all together sometimes. I call them uh, either Flink or Flip. You know, Flink, Pulsar, NiFi, flipping. <laughs> they work really well together, especially like I mentioned, where NiFi is good at getting things started, but you might want to not do all the processing in there, especially if you want to do things like join streams, you know, scale out uh, certain ways to do processing, any kind of stateful streaming. That's when you might want to start moving over to Flink and the way to connect NiFi and Pulsar in uh, uh, Flink together in a, an expandable manner that scales out really well. Put Pulsar in the middle, makes it very uh, easy to do that. Also lets you have, you know, different people maybe consuming it. Gives you lots of different options versus Kafka. You know, you don't have to do uh, in order consumer group sort of thing. You could act as uh, work queues. Might be different ways you might want to do messaging. Uh, just an idea here when we're doing uh, some of these apps where you can run them, where I work, we can run them pretty well. Obviously, everything's Apache. There's some really great open source runners for Kubernetes out there. So if you like uh, hand doing your Kubernetes, you could do it there. Uh, one interesting thing, because you brought up HDFS, Pulsar stores all its data separate from where it does messaging. So Apache Bookkeeper can have tiered storage to HDFS. So may give you a reason why you want NiFi to be grabbing that later because you can have uh, all these messages into HDFS. So you can have your messages about HDFS and HDFS, and then you're kind of in a, in a circle of uh, programming there. But as I mentioned, a common paradigm is NiFi gets the thing. Text file, PDF. I'll show you a bunch of different examples. Pretty much anything you could think of. Is there If there isn't a connector... If you know any kind of basic Java, you can write your own. Lots of in the community. I made some for uh, OpenNLP and Tika and MXNet. Very easy to connect those different types of processing or different sources and syncs. Now, if I, I'll push it to Pulsar, then Flink could read it. Or it could be stored via a sync into HDFS or Solar. ton of different open source connectors out there. Okay, this is a helpful one, I think, is what is the basic idea for an iFi? Pick some data sources, do some validation, maybe aggregate them, maybe eliminate some bad rows, send it somewhere. That's pretty much, if you know that, you can write any application. I'm not going to go spend too much time on the intro stuff, but I want it linked here for the, uh, so when you've got the slides later. If you're in NiFi uh, 300, you've probably seen the basic architecture. Hasn't changed much yet, though there is uh, the ability to run it on Kubernetes. That part, 
Uh, there's a couple different open source implementations out there. Uh, it, it really makes things better because one of the potential flaws with NiFi in my mind is these individual nodes have their own repositories. So they're kind of tied to the compute nodes. So if those go down, it may slow down processing or data, you know, may be hard to uh, recover. In the Kubernetes runtime, those are extrapolated out. You have your storage outside of the nodes, node go down, just bring it back up and then it's reconnected to the uh, data. That is a nice way to do that. If you haven't used version control, please use version control. It's very easy to make a slight change and maybe break something and not figure out what you did. Version control, even if you're not really concerned about, you know, what you do with these versions or maybe even just working alone, this will let you revert to previous versions, show you what changed, even if it's just moving stuff on the screen. Very helpful for debugging things. Very helpful to be able to run two versions of something, production version, development version, see if there's any issues there, good for integration testing. In the newest versions, which I recommend upgrade to 1.14.0, there's probably going to be a new release very shortly. Uh, be on the latest version if you can, or near to it. I like to run on a, you know, dot one or dot two. One fourteen zero has been really stable though. Uh, one of the features that's nice is if you remember Nine Five from years ago, if you wanted to back up your stuff, it was XML. Maybe not people's favorite uh, data storage at this point. It works. It's not the best. Now you could use JSON. That could be downloaded from the UI by just right-clicking. could also be done, which, uh, if again, if you haven't explored too deep into NiFi, there's a REST API behind every single thing on the screen. There's also now... Uh, analogous to that REST API, there is a command line interface to do almost everything. And then my friend Dan in uh, the UK has written a Python wrapper for that REST API. And that you can programmatically do just about everything. So there, there is a good DevOps story there. Repositories are important. If you undersize these, your code will break. You will be unhappy. Again, that's why I like the uh, Kubernetes runtime. Keep those stored somewhere else. Put them in really fast storage that uh, doesn't isn't going to crash easy, isn't going to get corrupt, and is big. I mean, flow files. I pull in terabytes of data. Well, it's going to live in that flow file repository for some amount of time. Same with content. The more provenant storage I have, the more uh, ability I can look through previous lineage which is helpful for debugging. It's just useful information. Again, available for a REST API, or you could push that out somewhere, depending on what you want to do. Knowing exactly how every piece of data in your system was in loaded could be really important, could be required for lots of different uh, government or regulations like GDPR. So you might want to keep uh, close ties on that. If you haven't started using record processors, do them. There is no drawback to using them. The only thing is you got to have data that is one of these readers or writers. There's a lot out there. If it's somewhat formatted data, there should be a reader and writer for it. If not, definitely add that to the community. If it hasn't started already, you might want to be the first. You know, it's a great thing to have. It is also a lot faster than the non-record processors. So you get that performance, you get the ease of use, you get the reusability, and you get the ability to do SQL on your data thanks to Apache Calcite, very uh, underappreciated project that's really important. So between that, there's a no-brainer. Use records. They make your life easier. They make things faster. You could do thousands of records at a pop. Highly recommend. Rewrite your code. It's worth the effort. It will speed things up, make things cleaner, easier to write, reusable. Do it. Uh, if you haven't looked and right-clicked on your uh, connections, there's a lot more in there now. 
You got the ability to do different types of load balancing. There's different prioritizers. This is useful stuff. There's also on that BRAC pressure threshold, you can enable uh, different algorithms to predict the sizing because it's not always easy to tell what size I should set those buffers to. Those can be automatically adjusted. Uh, yeah, I love the PLC 4X project. That's another great one that's friends with NiFi. NiFi is, is great for ecosystems, especially Apache. Connectors between every possible thing there. Great thing. Lots of diagnostics right through NiFi, and we'll go through these. What's nice here, if you see something on the screen, turn your uh, browser uh, JavaScript console on, and you'll see all the calls it's making. You could just copy those, put them in a curl, and you're ready to go. Uh, the video recording, it takes them a little while to post it. It's not posted right away, but it'll be in the ApacheCon uh, YouTube. And it'll be for every talk at the conference, unless something breaks, which hopefully it won't be. But uh, it'll be out there. My slides, I'll post them in the chats. But I have them uh, under my GitHub github.com slash tspanhw, and it'll be under my speaker profile. I'll put it in SlideShare. If you want to find it, you'll find it. I'll put it in Twitter or put it in LinkedIn. You'll see the slides. Don't worry about that. Video recording, ApacheCon will have out. It usually takes them a little time. I mean, it's volunteers have to chop up these videos and put them out there. It takes a little time, but they will be out there. And if you registered here, you'll get that notification. Pretty easy there. Oh, you can use PLC 4X with records. That's very nice. I, I think I got to try that out. That and, uh, and Apache stream pipes are, are really interesting. What's kind of cool with NiFi is controllers. If you haven't seen them before, this is nice. I can set this at a process group, reuse them. Uh, this is the one for authentication for Pulsar. Them are my friend David. There's... So many different uh, controllers out there. These connection pools makes things really easy. Scheduling. If you don't want to be streaming all the time, which maybe you aren't. Maybe you only want to run things at a certain time. Every controller has its own uh, potential for doing cron tab. I'll show you that in some code. Uh, lots of different things you can connect to. Apache Solar is one. It's really easy to do that. I just talked at uh, the Activate Conference for Solar. Really nice way to interface between NiFi and Solar. Again, most NiFi with most of the other Apache projects works very nice. Uh, I'm using a loaded term here. This is not full CDC. You got to use Debezium and probably pay somebody. But if you're doing simple CDC, especially something on... Uh, a database that has uh, fields that update like IDs or timestamps. Very easy to do that with NiFi with query database table record. You don't have to know the names of fields. We can either automatically figure out the schema or you could put it in a schema registry, figure it out that way. Pretty simple to do. This is where all the errors go. I've got a link to an uh, example of how you could use this in your own dashboards. DevOps, pretty easy. This is some of the examples for command lines. Uh, if you download the NiFi toolkit, it has everything you want in there. And you can look at pretty much everything. What's the status of a process group? What's the list of all of them? What's at the top? Start and stop things, remove things, add things. It makes it very easy for deploying to other servers, but also for starting and stopping things as need be. You know, maybe you deploy everything, start it, stop it. You can remove it when it's done, especially if you're doing something like Kubernetes or Docker. Start up the cluster or a single node, deploy a flow, deploy parameters, start things, have them run. Wait till you get some certain message or, you know, uh, record count and start shutting things down. And you could automate that as easy as you want. Now, we know about spaghetti code. NiFi doesn't have code. I mean, it does for processors, but it's more of a flow. Uh, so I call it spaghetti flows. We don't want spaghetti flows. Uh, there's a couple gotchas that have 
I have seen in production at Fortune 500 companies, don't do these. It's going to hurt you, make NiFi look bad. And people are going to say, oh, NiFi is not any good. Well, it's not NiFi's fault. <laughs> don't do these things. Don't put a thousand flows on one workspace. You will not be able to follow that. <laughs> things will get lost. Things will start slowing down. There's too much there. If you want a lot on the screen, really use the version control. Take it, put it away. Or don't just stop things. If it's not running, stop and disable. If it's stopped, NiFi is going to check all those process groups and all those processors to see if something's going on with them. If you disable them, they're ignored. Doesn't really have much overhead in the in your servers. That's a big difference. You leave them all running or even stopped, a lot of overhead for no reason. If you have too many steps, and I can't say that I'm not guilty of this sometimes, there's probably something wrong. Uh, if you have 100 steps to accomplish something, maybe you need to farm some of that coding out to something. Maybe write a custom processor that does some. Maybe you put it in Pulsar and have Flink do it later or Spark do it later. Or maybe some custom code or a Pulsar function. Maybe, it, maybe it's just something that takes too much steps for an iFi. It could be. Maybe have NiFi do the start and the finish, chunk out some of that middle, do something else. We don't really want to call a lot of command line shell scripts or groovy scripts or Python in the middle of a process. I mean, you're shelling out a process that's heavyweight. I can't say I haven't done that. And it's certainly easy to, to do that in NiFi. Maybe that should be in Apache Airflow. You know, there's a lot of open source projects out there in Apache. You know, take a look at some other ones. You know, this certainly will work, but, you know, <laughs> things might slow down once you get a lot of stuff going on. Uh, make sure you check out these processors before you use them. I've seen a couple ones that people did as an example, and it wasn't really fully working, including some of my own. And this is, and I usually will put that on there. This is a beta test. You know, I saw, okay, it's possible. Don't, pull, don't put that in production. <laughs> make sure you add more RAM. When you just do the initial install, if you don't change any config, uh, it's 512 meg. That is not a lot of RAM to run anything other than a couple of toys. Make sure you put a couple gig of RAM there. That's not a lot to ask for today, even if you're running on a laptop. If you're running production, don't one run node. <laughs> Unless it's like, a, oh, you're using stateless NiFi. Don't, you know, don't split millions of records. And not realize that's going to take a lot of space, memory, back pressure. You know, if you're dealing with big chunks of data, every decision you make is could be painful. Don't split if you don't have to. Reasonable sized chunks of data are, are better to work with. What's good? Reuse stuff. Don't hard code any things that you don't have to. Parameters are awesome. They can be applied remotely with command line interface, REST. Very easy to do. I'll show you some of those. You got custom Java code out there already that solves the problem? Put that into a custom processor. Just have it call that library. Record processors. Read the docs. The documents we have are great out there. If you see something wrong with the docs, hey, that's a good time to get involved in the Apache uh, Software Foundation. Fix them docs. <laughs> that's great. You know, everyone's contribution helps. Use the registry for version control. Use DevOps. Make sure you understand flow. Sometimes you, while you're building it, what's nice is NiFi can run while you're doing things. Well, you know, you may want to drop out a couple of steps later, do some refactoring. You know, routing is good. Uh, make sure you use the correct drivers. You know, the driver may be working, but maybe really old. There's updates for those JDBC drivers for Oracle, MySQL, everybody out there pretty frequently. Keep an eye on them. Put them somewhere in a stable location. Uh, some of that's going to be automated in the future with uh, different repositories. But right now, you might want to put that as part of your DevOps process. Check for drivers. Put them in a place. Make sure all the nodes in your cluster can access it. You know, Because at some point, you're going to be upgrading. You'll be moving to other servers. Keep all those kind of scripting and things together. Um, 
you mentioned the sequel merge record this is helpful again we talked about splitting things apart put them back together this works very well especially if you want to minimize the amount of calls to something or something like hdfs where you hate to have these tiny files if you're willing to take that time trade-off like here i did a minute maybe it's an hour give me a big file push this once that may be a lot better for the people downstream in your object store in your hdfs you know wherever that happens to be going they may appreciate that they may not want a million tiny files maybe uh 10 big ones are better you could figure that out there's a lot of uh room for uh, processing those things we said parameters we'll show you those load balancing this has been uh, a big enhancement you can load balance between each step we'll do that so you get to see that let's let's get some to uh some examples before we uh to the demo before we run out of time here i've got a couple more slides i don't want to spend all your time on slides here i'll give you those slides they will be available uh later today after to do my second talk on deep learning at two uh two eastern time i think that's 17 or 18. Uh, i don't know these times uh, just a quick thing on Apache Pulsar, which is my favorite connector for NiFi. Really nice tool here because I like NiFi. It's kind of a jack of many trades because it has that multi-protocol support. Because sometimes I've got device data on MQTT. Sometimes it's AMQP. Sometimes it's Kafka. It's JMS. I have a lot of different protocols here. Pulsar can listen to all those makes it very easy for me to not have to have 15 different things running. I could have Pulsar and NiFi running and Flink and pretty much run everything I need there. Maybe Spark is another great one to have in there as well. Again, you know, it's nice to have more Apache projects, but let's keep it manageable. Let's look at some examples. Now we were in here before showing you the uh, HDFS, pretty straightforward. Let me show you some new stuff you might not have noticed. If I right click again, right clicking is a great thing everywhere. But if I look here on the main page, I can empty everything. I can also download everything as one big JSON file. Now that probably makes more sense. Yep, there's the official channel. Thank you. And they show up pretty quickly. And there's there's a lot of stuff from last year that's really relevant too. That's really good. So definitely check out the YouTube channel. Great stuff there. Right click. I can configure everything. There's some enhancements here. Really nice. I could add my parameters, any parameters that are already created. Comments. I could figure out how I want the concurrency to happen. I can configure back pressure for everybody under there. Helpful things. Access to any of the controllers that I'm using in this entire uh, process group. Very helpful. Bunch of different ones here. Let's say go into this one. I've got, again, you can nest them as low as you want to go to be able to uh, do a lot of processing. You might start getting that code smell here as I'm doing a lot. Uh, some of this is extraneous for showing some different uh, text processing features. Like here, I'm just grabbing all the files I have on my uh, local machine. It's pretty much all my presentations. I list them, I fetch them. One thing nice to see here is the state. So if I have this running, which it stopped, it's gonna wait for another file, new file shows up, boom, it'll grab it. Helpful, you know, leave these things running, you get new data. Here's a built-in one, I grabbed some metadata. Uh, this one is uh, my custom processor. Uh, I didn't give it a good name because you see here there's one very similar name there. I don't know why I did that. Not very smart. Uh, this is the data provenance. Remember I said you could watch it in the REST API. If I go to developer tools and I go to uh, network, uh, say I refresh this page here. You'll look down here and I'll go into uh, provenance and you can look into uh, network and you could see every rest call I'm making. So here I could just copy this. 
again, really fun here to do this live. But uh, this is a for this one isn't a get. Some of them are get, some of them are post. You'll have to check that when you do it. I think statuses, and you can see the result of those rest calls, and you could call them as well. So say I copy, uh, let's see which one this is, bulletins. Let's copy that uh, URL, and then we could just run that uh, over here, and you could see what's returned. I have no errors, which is impressive. But just to give you an idea, you want to check what that REST API is. You could do that while it's running. As you see, it grabbed that for one specific provenance event. Now it grabbed the attributes. It's grabbing some icons. Some of that's not as interesting. But you got all those REST calls there that you might be interested in. Again, provenance is pretty cool. Yeah, it's nice to see. <laughs> the, you know, HTML code is not as exciting as it was 25 years ago. Still pretty cool. But you can see some of the metadata that was generated in attributes while not changing the content. Helpful things. Here I split it out, extracted text. Here's that NLP processor. Yeah, I, I, I'm i putting this in. I have, I'll put make sure this is in a GitHub. So I could download this. This is from an older article. But see here, I'm going to download that flow. It's going to be JSON. I'll make sure that's uploaded in my Apache Con uh, GitHub, but it, it, it's pretty straightforward. Again, if you don't have my custom processors, you're going to have to go get them. That's why this one's a bit of a pain because this one I have my open NLP processor, my core NLP processor, fortunately not Apache licensed. But what are you going to do there? The attribute cleaner. I put this one is because some systems especially Avro, don't like weird uh, attribute names. So this renames them to be Avro compliant. Uh, that's important to me because here I take every single attribute and build a new file from it. Again, because that metadata, really valuable to me. To Actually, in fact, more valuable than the real data. Because here I'm just looking at that data and I want to do things with it. So I grabbed all that metadata you see here, there's no underscores, there's no spaces, there's no periods. I took all that out so it doesn't uh, break anybody's code. Unfortunately, some code out there is fragile. Organizing workflows. Having a lot of, yeah, how would you refactor this one? Now here is, you look and see, is are these things I need every time? You know, for this particular use case, I don't need the metadata. I just wanted to show some different use cases. Split text, I kind of needed for this one. NLP, do I want to do NLP processing? Maybe, maybe not. Again, I could take, these are two custom processors. I could combine them into one. That's dropping out of step. If my attributes are clean enough, I can remove that. If I don't want to build metadata, I don't need that. I, I should do this infer once and remove it from the uh, flow, which I should probably do that right now. Just get rid of that. That's kind of uh, useful once so you don't have to uh, manually generate a schema. You know, you could use command line tools. but And we don't really need to set the schema because I could just infer it. You know, that's, uh, you know, something that's... Uh, like here, I'm just inferring it, so I don't really need a schema name. So I could drop out that step as well. So if I stop this, again, you start uh, removing things until you really need it. Oh, that's a unique feature. If something's running and it's taken too slow to stop, there'll be a terminate here. Helpful thing. So that dropped out a couple of steps. You can also make things reusable. Like if I'm always doing a put solar, Maybe I should create a process group for that. You know, put the solar. And maybe that one, I should put that in there with a standard in and out. Because it doesn't really care. This could be a parameter. This could be a parameter. This could be a parameter. You know, and this is just going to infer it based on what data comes in. So this is generic. I don't have to have this in there. I can make this once. Make this a versionable uh, system and just go from there. 
So you, you have those options there to get rid of uh, the, the flow smell or the code smell that this is too big, doing too much. You know, you just edit that down. That's usually what you do. Or you look and see, is there anything that, you know, if there's no other way to do it, like here, mm, I could get rid of that. This one converts PDF to text. Uh, I kind of need that. You know, if, if there's nothing you can get rid of, that's just the way it is. If it's reusable, pull that out, make its own process group. And, you know, I like to see a flow that's, you know, step one, you know, and then another reusable component connects to them. And, you know, you have, we have that on the main page here. Like here, this process is status. This pushes things to Pulsar. This generates uh, the data to, about uh, which feed to do it. So these stand alone, breaks it out. Nice way to do it. Again, is break things down to as small a module as you can. That is very useful. Don't leave stuff like I'll, I'm guilty of leaving stuff lying around because <laughs> I was playing with it once. And, you know, then all of a sudden you've got hundreds of these flows here. And you're like, oh, what am I doing in this one? What am I doing in that one? And then you might forget. You're afraid to get rid of it. You know, download it. Put it in version control. Get rid of it till you need it. I, I, I haven't found a great way to refactor things perfectly. You know, if it comes to the point where you see that 100-step flow, walking through each time with a piece of running data, which is unique to NiFi, makes you uh, figure out how to do that. Like here, there must be a better way than using three update records to put the timestamp in there. Maybe I need a custom processor. Maybe I could do it with SQL. I should spend the steps to, to, uh, to make that cleaner. Like here, I don't really need to do this control rate. This makes it nice for me for demos of not sending 10,000 records a second because I generate 10,000 and then it's gone. doesn't make for a good demo. It's nice to be able to see one record at a time going through the system. You know, it depends on what your uh, those extra steps are. Uh, the other thing to get rid of that is keep that in a separate flow. Make sure you can... It's inside of a reusable unit here, so it can be version controlled. And I can move that to, say, a container or a Kubernetes pod. It runs, and then it goes away. Then you don't have all those 5,000 flows running at once. If it's something that has to continuously run, then you should make sure that it's as uh, sleek as you can get there. But, you know, there's a lot of options there. I don't see any more questions. I'm not sure how much time I have. Uh, I, I thought it was 40, 45. No one stopped me yet. I don't want to get in someone else's way. I do have, uh, my next talk, which is, uh, Apache deep learning, which again is, there's going to be a lot of NIFI in that. So, uh, if you're interested, definitely come into that, uh, that I'll be using NIFI connected to MXNet and to DJL AI. Showing you different ways to do uh, data engineering around uh, deep learning. Yeah, yeah, this is, that is, that would be really stinky if it didn't have that. Let's see if I have one still here. Yeah, any of the list ones. Let's see where I have a list. Uh, I've got so many lists. Oh, I think I have a list file somewhere. Oh, probably on the screen. Yeah, for the next talk on Apache uh, Deep Learning, I'm doing a list of files. We showed you that one. Security, always want you to time out. Okay, let's see. Does this one have the list? Yeah, we were in here. So if a new file shows up, like if I run this, only new files would show up. There was three. Because if I go here, there's a state. So it knows the timestamp, it knows which ones ran. So it's not going to uh, add any new files until they show up. Now you might want to do something with the fetch to make sure uh, you could check there if you have uh, your own list there. But 
it, it's the same for most of these processors. They have a state on them. Like uh, anything that's listing, you know, you want to get metadata from tables. You know, any of these will have, well, not listen, but uh, any of these will have that cache there. And so it'll know what the state is and what's going on. So if you want to rerun things, you got to clear the state, stop it, clear state. See here, a couple of them running through the system here because there was three new ones that I dropped in. Let's see if these finish before I see them. Yeah, there's uh, some recent talks I just did. So I dropped them in the directory. Uh, this one's for the Pulsar Summit. That's for the uh, Solar Summit. Is there an extract doing OCR? There is a way to do that. Uh, usually, I'm trying to think if I have a custom processor for that. There is a Tesseract processor out there in the open source. I haven't uh, used it in a while. It, it does work. You can also call. Yeah, let's see if he still has it out there. Yeah, the Tesseract one still works. Uh, they've updated Tesseract a lot. So it might be better to call it through uh, Tika. Tika is really amazing project. So I'd probably have uh, Tika with uh, a Tesseract running in a Docker container. And that has a REST API. I'd have NiFi call out to it to do the OCR. Yeah, Tika, Tika would be the great way to do that. I did write a Tika processor, but I didn't add OCR to it because Tesseract licensing is a little weird. So I didn't want to put it in something I couldn't make uh, Apache. But uh, yeah, there, there's definitely an adapter for that out there. NiFi is awesome. Well, pretty much every Apache project that's supported is awesome. Uh, I think we're out of time. I got to move over to the next one. Thanks for coming. I'll make sure I post the source code, uh, the slides, all of these things that you might be interested in. Uh, if you have more questions, you can follow me over to the deep learning one. I'm not, uh, you know, it's NiFi plus deep learning, so there'll be uh, time to have NiFi questions there. Oh, yeah, let me put that in real quick. Uh, if you look through them, I have a lot of projects. But uh, if you go to the main one, you'll see uh, links to other things. Uh, underneath my speaker profiles, where I usually put the uh, presentations, or at least a link to them. Uh, thanks. I'm going to go to over to the next one before it starts. Uh, if you have more questions, please join me in Apache Deep Learning. Is it 30, 302.